Amen. Amen. We'd like to greet you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're certainly happy to be back in the house of the Lord again. And we just want to welcome our pastor, Brother John, from Sheffield, the UK. Also, his dear wife that came on Tuesday, and they're staying with Brother B. B. We'd like to welcome him. He's come to Zimbabwe uh, to a wedding, and he's leaving, I think, tomorrow sometime in the week. And we pray God will bless him as he would minister for us this morning. We also want to give a special welcome to Joel and his wife, uh, Sandrin. And we also want to give a welcome to Sister Mapofo and also Brother Vivian Crowder and also Brother Timothy from the Eastern Cape. We want to give them a special welcome. Then I want to thank God for adding another year to me today. It is my birthday from Sister Theodora. We want to wish our dear sister God's blessings on her birthday. I want to thank the Lord. I passed my driver's license on Wednesday, and I thank you for your prayers. All the glory goes to the Lord from Brother Sia. Then the Hillier family would like to thank the Lord for all went well yesterday, and we also like to thank the believers for their love and support from Brother Stephen Hillier. We want to thank those who could make it. May God richly bless you. Uh, then we also like to thank God for, as well for the believers who prayed for this request. I'll be starting my first day at the university tomorrow. Then, uh, God bless you, saints. I would like to give thanks for your prayers. God has provided me with a good job from uh, Brother Tinney. Then also, shalom, uh, saints. I am uh, coming to thank the pastor and all the saints for assisting me on my father's funeral. God bless you all from Brother Elijah. Then also from Brother Elisha, pray request, God bless you, saints, please remember me in your prayers. I need the Lord to provide fees and books for my studies and extend my visa, which is expiring on the end of March. Then please remember me in your prayers. My bucky was stolen on Wednesday from Brother Lawrence. Please remember my friend in your prayers tomorrow. He will be going for an eye operation. And God bless you, saints. Can you please pray for my grandpa, Wilson? He's sick and his whole body is swollen. He's in the Eastern Cape. And then last Sunday, we prayed for a nephew who was facing judgment, a court case on Wednesday. Last Wednesday, and God's grace, he was acquitted. The complainant withdrew the charges. Please pray for his salvation. He's in church this morning. Then also please uh, pray for safe traveling mercies for our mother uh, Goso uh, leaving for Zimbabwe today. And also uh, please pray for our Grandma Wilson and then all of them have been read off as well. Then we also want to remember Brother Joseph Latola. He, had, uh, he couldn't breathe very well so on Friday uh, it became a bit worse so he went to the doctor. They referred him to Malamed and they put some tests on him, so he's just uh, slowly recovering, so we want to cover your prayers for him as well. If you want to know anything about further, you can just phone his wife, Sister Val, and she'll give you an update. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's offer prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we are thankful that you're the giver of life and the giver of all good things. When we think of life, we think of God. When we think of light, we think of God. Amen. When we think of love, we think of God. Amen. So you are love, you are light, you are spirit, you are word. And everything of God, without you, Lord, we are, we are nothing. Yes. Lord, you're the one who put us on the earth, and you, oh God, designed the planet. And everything, Lord, is in your hands. Amen. And Father, we want to pray for the words, words of thanks that has come in today. Our brother, Lord, who has been acquitted, Lord, from the court case. We pray for him for the salvation of his soul. Pray for Brother Elijah that you brought him safe back from Belgium. We want to say thank you for Brother Tini, O oh God, that you provided the work for him. And God, we want to say thank you for the brother, O oh God, who is starting at university tomorrow. We pray for the Helia family, O oh God. We pray for our sister Ala that is here in the house of the Lord. Pray that you will pour strength in you know. God, living with somebody for 62 years, and now your partner is gone. And Lord, there's a lot of memory and a lot of loneliness. But I pray that you will pour strength within her and that you'll be a very present help in the time of trouble. Thank you for Brother Sia, oh God, who passed his driver's test. Sister Theodora, Lord, is celebrating her birthday. And Lord, we pray for all the visitors within our gate. We also pray for Brother Elijah, oh God, his requests. 
And God, he needs prayer. Oh, Lord God, that you provide for him fees and books and studies and also extend his visa. We pray that you will undertake for our brother. We pray, oh God, for somebody's grandpa, Wilson. We seek, oh God, in the Eastern Cape. We pray that the hand of God will reach out to Grandpa Wilson. We also want to remember a friend of God in prayer for tomorrow. He'll be going for eye operation. And we want to pray for this friend that you will be with them. We pray for our brother Lawrence, whose bucky was stolen, that you will provide him, oh God, whatever he needs. We pray for our sister God, so Lord, who's traveling to Zimbabwe, that you will be with her, give her safe traveling mercies. And Father, we pray for every unspoken request. We pray, God, that you will hear our prayer. As we raise our hands before you, all of us, oh God, have some certain needs in our families, in our homes, our neighbors, in our own self. And we have our own battles. We have our marriage battles. We have our teenage battles. We have a lot of battles that we go through. But above all those battles, we thank you that you send your word to heal. And, oh God, we want to say thank you for the revealing, the unfolding of the Son of Man ministry. And, oh God, making yourself known to unite the head to the body. We certainly want to say thank you. We pray, oh God, for our brother, Pastor Brother John. Pray for his wife, oh God, all the way from Sheffield, the UK, traveling to Zimbabwe to a wedding. And being here, Lord, knowing many family and friends, we want to thank Brother B.R.B. for taking care of our brother. Amen. And we pray that you will bless them <clears throat> and be with them. And Father, we want to say thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for all that you've done for us. <clears throat> In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's sing a little song. Take me into the holies of holies while our brother would come and minister for us. <clears throat> Take me into the holies. Take me in by the blood of the Lamb. Just pray. Lord, we want to thank you for this blessed opportunity to share your word, to read the word of God together, and to hear what the prophet has said in this day by way of reading his quotations and giving some explanations. Lord, may you bless our sermon this, after, this morning. Bless the speaker. Bless the hearer. Father, may it minister grace to the hearers. We commit this uh, sermon now in your hands in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to greet you all in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I am so, so, so happy to be here. 
I've heard about Cape Town for many, many years. And I'd long to visit here one day. And God has given me the desire of my heart in my lifetime to be here. Amen. Amen. I want to thank Brother B.A.B. who invited me here to pass through his home. He says, Brother John, when you are going to the wedding, can you pass through Cape Town and see us? And to him and his family have been a wonderful Christians to our family. He has looked after my brother's son, Farai, uh, looked after him, natured him like his own child, and kept him in his own home, and extended part of my family the best love you could ever get anywhere. Yes. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, yes. when you have love one for another. Yes. So I want to appreciate our precious deacon brother here. And I also want to appreciate the pastor here. He has been a blessing to us for many years. I knew him when he once visited us some years back, maybe about 30 or so years in Zimbabwe. Uh, he didn't have any gray hair at that time. And he preached to us. And uh, over the years also, we've been blessed by his many deep teachings of the Word of God. And his booklets, uh, we've had students also come here, study here, and they brought us materials from here. And we have been enriched by your efforts here, yeah. by the pastor and the, uh, the congregation supporting him. Yeah. And I've heard of the many things you're doing towards missionary work, not only here in South Africa, but also I come from Zimbabwe and in Malawi and other places. Yeah. The prophet says when you're doing missionary work, you are in the will of God. Yeah. I want to say the pastor and you, the whole congregation, you are in the will of God. Yeah. And I want to say, like St. Paul says in uh, Timothy 2, 3, verse, Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 to 15, to, talking to the young Timothy, says, continue on with the work you are doing. Continue on with the work you are doing. And remember whom you have learned the scriptures from. And that you, from a young age you have known the Holy Scriptures. And I want to say to this church, I want to say to Pastor Beckett, continue on with the good work. Amen. Um, so my name is John Mukangano, and I brought my wife, as the pastor has already introduced, I'll ask my wife to stand up, Sister Titi, she has, she's my better half, we, we met when we were 21 years in Harare, and when I saw her, my heart jumped a bit, I missed a bit. I said, who is this angel? Where did this angel come from? <laughs> I asked for her details, and uh, something spoke to my heart. I said, that is going to be your wife. Yeah. That is your wife. I said, who is this? This is going to be my wife. I started talking to her, started to uh, court, courtship, uh, trying to interest her. And as I started telling my friends, I have already found my wife. Yeah. And the rest is history. We got married. We've been together for 40 years. <laughs> five children and three grandchildren. Amen. So this morning, without wasting, you know, I'm coming from, uh, I don't want to <laughs> spend too much time. Let me, let us stand up. I just want to give a little exhortation, then I'll give you a testimony. Uh, I thought if I start with the testimony, it will be, I will get carried away. So I would like this morning to bring a little exhortation or a little sermon called Standing in the Gap, uh, taking inspiration from the prophet, Standing in the Gap, the message Standing in the Gap, I'm sure many of you have already heard it, and that's my inspiration this morning, Standing in the Gap. So we will read from the Bible, I uh, will read, I uh, would like you to stand for a long time, so we'll read from two portions, uh, we can start with, uh, uh, I think numbers, maybe let's start with numbers, uh, my things. Numbers chapter 14, uh, because that's where the story comes. Then I'll read three portions, then we will, uh, you hear what I'll say, and you fill in the gaps. Amen. Numbers chapter 14, I think it'll be good if we start from verse 11. Uh, from verse 11, Numbers chapter 14. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will these people provoke me? God was angry. They had done something. They would come to the border of, with the promised land. They were supposed to go in without asking questions. 
they sent spies and then they gave an evil report and they wanted to go back to Egypt. Right at the borderland, right at the border when they were supposed to cross over. Amen. And God was angry, says, how long shall these people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them, I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them. And will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. He was talking to Moses. I'm going to destroy them and make you, Moses, a greater and mightier nation. And Moses said unto the Lord, Then the Egyptians shall hear it. For thou broughtest up these people in the midst from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. For they have heard that thou, Lord, thou Lord art among these people, and that the Lord art seen face to face, and that thy cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them by daytime, and a pillar of cloud, and in a pillar of fire by night. Now, if thou shalt kill all these people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring these people, his, these people into the land which he swore unto them, therefore he hath slain them in the wilderness. Moses gave an argument to the Lord, a reasonable argument. How can you destroy them? Then the people say, you were not able. In other words, Moses was standing in the gap for the people. And now I beseech thee, let the power of, the, of my Lord be great, according as thou hast spoken, say, the Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generations. Pardon. Hey, Moses was now standing. Lord, you can pardon, you can have mercy. You can have mercy, you can uh, forgive. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of these people, according unto the greatness of thy mercy. And as thou hast forgiven these people from Egypt even until now. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 He can also pardon according to your word. Amen. If you stand in the gap for somebody. Uh, let's read Psalms uh, 106. Uh, Psalms 106, verse uh, 23. Okay, I'm, not going to... um, I'm refraining from reading from my PowerPoints because uh, the Bible says, Blessed is he that readeth from this book. <laughs> so, just, uh, I had the scripture in my PowerPoint, so I want to read from the Bible. Amen. Amen. Uh, verse 23 of Psalms 106, the Bible says, Therefore, be, he said, that he would destroy them, referring to the scripture I read. Therefore, he said that he would destroy them, had not Moses, his chosen, stood before him in the bridge to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. So somebody had to stand and turn God's wrath away. Uh, last scripture, before we sit down, we go to Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 22. Uh, verse 30, we will read. Ezekiel 22, verse 30, the Bible says, uh, if you read Ezekiel chapter 1, it, it again details the sin of the people of Israel. How everybody from the young to the old, to the priests, to the prophets, to the rulers, how they were taking bribery and doing all evil. And God was about angry to destroy. And he said, verse 30, and I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. When God is angry about to destroy any nation against any people, he sends mercy. He looks for a man who can intercede for them, who can teach them and bring them back. But he says there, I looked for a man to stand in the gap, but I found none. I found none. 
It says, verse 31, Therefore I poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, said the Lord God. Let us pray. Lord, we have just read your holy scripture. I am trembling standing here because your word is forever settled in the heavens. Your word is the truth. And you are God, you change not. You are the same yesterday, today, forever. The great I am. Dear God, as we speak about these words, Father, may you polish them up for us. May they become food and drink this morning for your children. You said, men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. May we get some food and drink from these scriptures this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Amen. Standing in the gap. Amen. Amen. What it means, what does standing in the gap mean? It means somebody stands for you. When you're about to be destroyed, like we've just read, the children of Israel had come to the borderland of the, they had walked two and a half years, they'd come out from Mount Sinai, they had been given the statues and judgments and the laws to possess the land. But when they came to the border, something happened, they stopped. The prophet said they should have never stopped. They should just say, proceed and possess the land. But they stopped, and they, somebody brought a funny idea that we must send our own people to spy the land to see whether it's really flowing with milk and honey. God had already said, I have spied the land for you which flows with milk and honey. They should have taken God's word and proceeded. But they stopped. And it's a lesson for all of us that we must not stop. Start questioning the word of God. Start reasoning. Start wanting to prove it. By your own uh, scientific uh, uh, experiments, they sent uh, 12, and Brother Bram says they were intellectuals. They were men of renown. They were theologians. And they, they saw what they saw with the natural eye, and of course, the place had giants. The place had walled cities. They saw the Anaks, uh, the sons of Anak with six fingers uh, on each hand and uh, six toes on each foot. And they were giants, they say, we look like grasshoppers in their sight. They exaggerated and they, they discouraged the people. And when they did that, the people wanted to stone Moses. They actually pulled up stones. If you read uh, earlier on, Numbers 14, I didn't read, I started from half. They actually pulled up stones. They wanted to stone Joshua and Caleb. Because they were, giving a, they were trying to give a true report. They also wanted to stone Moses and Aaron. They were, they were targeting four people. And God intervened. The cloud of glory came down. And then what we read, that's what God says, okay, I have forgiven them ten times. At the various stages I was counting. But this one now I have to give judgment. And Brabra says, uh, Kadesh Bania was the judgment seat of the world. God gave judgment and says, okay, I will not forgive now. All those who came from Egypt who were above 18 years, in other words, they were 20 years at the time with Kadesh Barnea. He says, all those who came 18 years from Egypt who are 20 now and below, I'll forgive, they'll enter. But all those who, are, who came after 18 years, that's why we count 18 years as the age of accountability. From that time, he says, anybody above 18 was responsible enough. He should have seen my miracles. He should have seen what I did to the Egyptians. He should have seen what I did in the Red Sea. He should have seen what I did uh, when I changed the water, uh, the um, uh, bitter waters. He must have seen what I did at uh, Mount Sinai when I gave them the Ten Commandments. But now they rejected. They will perish in the wilderness. I don't want to commit a genocide, genocide one day, but they will die slowly for 38 years. In the world, they wandered around in the desert going nowhere until all of them perished. But God wanted to destroy all, but there was a man who stood there, Moses. He said, Lord, you cannot. If you want to kill them, then kill me. He stood in the gap. Uh, you know what a gap is? They said the bridge. The Bible scripture says, who could stand in the bridge? The bridge is like when you have a walled city, you've got a castle inside. You've got a walled city, but somewhere, somehow, one portion of the wall falls down. Then it becomes a gap where the enemy can come in. It becomes a witness in the fortress. God says, then I look for a man who could go in, the, uh, in that bridge where the wall is fallen and build it up again so that the place is satisfied, so that the enemy could not come in. And God was angry with them. Then somebody stood. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there it is. Amen. Amen. That's what a bridge is. That's a fortified uh, 
poor example, though, of a wall that's a, a, a stone wall, but then there's a bridge. God says, I need somebody to go and stand there and guard the, uh, the city so that when danger comes, he can warn the people or fight. So to stand in the gap is being able to defend your people inside. Amen. To be able to say, Lord, uh, stop here. Don't, I've got my people here. Or in the said, when it's about God, then it's you standing like Moses did. And he said, Lord, you cannot kill them. You kill me. Because the Egyptians will hear that you, you took them. And then you failed to let them go in. Please, Lord, forgive. And God says, I have pardoned according to your word. So this gives us an example. He also says again, where we read in Ezekiel, if you read Ezekiel 22, everybody was doing wrong. The priests were taking bribery. Uh, the, the, the political leaders were taking bribery. The prophets were making false. They were making many widows and the poor. And also they were taking money from the people and doing all sorts of things. And God says, I'm angry with this. I, I, I don't like this. I'm now looking for a man who can stand in the bridge because I'm about to bring judgment. Amen. And he says, I couldn't find any. And I say, friends, we are also living in the end time. This world is ready for judgment. We have come to the end of the world. We have the, come to the end of the political system. We have come to the end of uh, the financial systems. Everything is coming to an end. Another world won't last 30 minutes uh, with the atomic bombs hanging, sitting in the hangars right now. Anything can happen. And God is about to destroy many people. Many people are going to die without knowing Christ. And God is looking for men who stand in the gap. Amen. At the end of my sermon this morning, I want to ask a question. Who will stand in Cape Town? Who will stand in the gap in Cape Town? Who will stand in the gap in South Africa? Who will stand in the gap in your rural area? Who will stand in the gap in your classroom? Who will stand in the gap for the people at your workplace? Who will stand in the gap for your community? Who will stand in the gap for your people, your loved ones? Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. I'll give an example. I think I'd like to read the prophet. I'll just read from the prophet now. Um, Brother Branham says he was actually himself standing in the gap. Um, I will read from the message, standing in the gap, quotation, paragraph number 53. It says, now, you see, get close. I... I admired your pastor. He's a very good teacher. And uh, he condensed quotations so that he just gave you one statement. You don't have to read. But I, I came prepared with the old traditional, but I've learned something. Amen. My first sermon in service here, I came to the, uh, the memorial service on Tuesday, and I was so blessed by the many brothers who spoke uh, so well about our brother Lionel who went to be with the Lord. When I heard the testimonies, I said, I am one with that the brother was a man after my own heart. I saw his sons give testimonies here. I say, hey, these are men after my own heart. I saw them at the funeral yesterday. I say, I like this family. I like these kind of believers. God bless you. Brother Lionel is not dead. He's in a better place. He's much happier than he was. He's in a better boy than he was. He's much happier where he is than if he was here today, he was in an old body, but he's in a brand new body from glory. Uh, Brother Brown says, now I'm preaching to myself in this, could we stand, see a human being, it says, could you see a human being that's blind, physically blind, and know that he's walking over a cliff? Could, our, in our state of mind that we are in this morning, could we stand and see a blind man walk over a cliff and not try to warn him? It will be there, it will be so cruel, we would be so indifferent in our heart. Could you imagine a person getting so indifferent that he could almost laugh and see a blind man that cannot see and can't help himself deliberately walk over a cliff? That would be a bad thing. Brother Brown says, if you see a blind man walking, he can't see he's going over a cliff and you know that he's going to die or fall and you don't do something, you are so cruel. It's such a bad thing. And I want to say this morning in this service, if you have got your loved ones who are unsaved, your parents, your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your relatives, and you are seeing them, they are heading to a, a Christless a, a, a hell, and you don't do something, the prophet says, it's very bad. 
Shall God find a man in your family who will stand in the gap for the whole family? Shall God find a, a man in your classroom who will stand for the, in the gap for the classroom? Shall God find a man in your company who will stand for all the other employees and try to point them to the correct thing? Shall God find a man wherever you are in your rural area, in your home, who will stand for the area? Let us not be cruel. Yes. Brother Brown says in adoption, uh, paragraph 92, he says, I would rather just a little overzealous. He says, if I'm a Christian, I would rather be a little overzealous to try to win them in, try to win your brother in, your sister in, your relatives in. Brother Brown says, I would rather be overzealous about, it, about the Father's kingdom than to have no zeal at all. Mm -hmm. For it is, I would rather overwork and as the Church of Christ preacher told me some day ago, Mr. Branham, I would rather I would rather wear out than rust out. And that's a lot of truth. I would rather wear out and die in the harness, as Brother Never said, than to refuse to have the harness on. You can't do nothing anyways than to neglect to try. So my message this morning, if you have got any loved one, like Moses said, loved ones. He had Miriam. Miriam was also going to die. And the other ones. Probably Aaron was also going to die. He had made a golden calf. He was going to die. A lot of them, they were going to die that day. And Moses stood in the, in the gap. So be zealous. I'm saying let us be zealous. Uh, to be zealous means to, to, be, to have enthusiasm. Let me just, uh, the by dictionary talk something about being zealous. Um, we need to be zealous. Uh, to have enthusiasm in it. Put your whole energy in it. Put your whole energy in it. Don't just be slothful. Amen. Amen. Um, let me read another quote then. Brother Brown says in the message, the flashing red light of his coming. He says, while there's mercy and someone standing the gap, Jesus Christ, and an open door tonight, won't you receive him? So Jesus Christ also stood in the gap for us. When all mankind was dying, he went and died on the cross for us. Standing in the gap, hanging, as the pastor said yesterday at the funeral, standing between heaven and earth, hanging on a tree. He was standing in the gap for all humanity. Between earth and heaven, he was trying to connect people back to God. Amen. Jesus Christ standing in the gap, giving us an example. Amen. Now, how do you stand in the gap for your people? How do you stand in the gap? How are you going to stand in the gap for your brother, your sister, if you have a loved one who is not saved or who is poor, and you want to stand in the gap for them? Let's see the example of what Moses did. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 24, he says, You have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. I'm reading from Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 24. I think my PowerPoint is there so I can read quickly. We can go quickly if you don't want We can quickly go faster. Deuteronomy 9, verse 24, the Bible says, Therefore, you, you have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. Thus I fell down before the Lord forty days and forty nights as I fell down at the face, because the Lord had said he would destroy you. I prayed therefore unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, destroy not thy people and thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed through thy greatness, which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand. You see what the Bible says? Moses had to... Where we read, it looked like it, it was just talking casually and doing it, but it wasn't a casual talk. He goes on to explain that he actually took 40 days for that pardon to come. He had to fast and pray for 40 days and 40 nights on the floor. That's what he says. Because the Lord said, I will destroy you. I prayed therefore unto the Lord not to destroy these people and their inheritance. And then the Lord said, I will pardon you. So the answer sometimes it doesn't come after a two minute prayer. You have to fast and pray. Some demons need the fasting and pray. When you are beginning to talk to the Lord and you want certain things done, you fast. Fasting, God expects all Christians. I think in Matthew chapter 6, he says, when you fast. He didn't say, uh, you, uh, he didn't say when you think of fast. He was like taking everybody fast. He says, when you fast. It was... Common, it was a, a standard uh, of a Christian, of a Christian hygiene to fast. When you want something, when you are serious, you have to show the Lord by fasting. Yes. Afflicting us all, the Bible says afflicting us all. I think Psalm 69, uh, verse, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Psalm 69, it says afflicting my soul. 
I afflict. Oh, Psalms 126. He says, I was afflicting my, my soul uh, to chastise. I was fasting to chastise my soul. So when you want your soul to, to straight, like a son does, uh, when you want your uh, boy is misbehaving, you chastise him. To correct, don't do this, son. You hold him with one hand and you chastise him with the other hand. You don't want him to run away. You want the boy to remain. He's your son. You don't want to destroy him. He has done something wrong, but you chastise him. And all the people that God loves, he chastises them and make them straight. And when you as an individual, me as an individual, when I want to walk around, maybe I'm having a problem with my eyes. Uh, they are seeing too much. Maybe they are lasting or doing or wanting the things of the world. The way you can stop it, pray and fast. Fasting is afflicting your soul. Amen. Fasting is chastising. You are straightening your soul that the flesh may be under subjection. Amen. So that the flesh, if it's looking at it, desiring many things, it's the flesh. You want to strengthen it by fasting. And that's what God did. He stopped eating, drinking. He says, Lord, the people are dying. What good shall it make me to, to lose all these people I've led? And I alone may be made a great nation. He stopped eating, drinking, and he fasted for 40 days. And then God says, I have pardoned according to your word. And I want to say this is a good example for all of us. Uh, if you were, if you've got any loved one, you want to bring them into the message. If you have any in this, uh, I'm not saying just the message, the ark of safety, because God is about to destroy the world, and there's an ark of safety, which is the, in Christ. Amen. Amen. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and they are safe. The only safe place is in the Word of God. The only safe place is in Christ. And if you want your loved ones to come in, you pray for them. You fast for them. Many days. Amen. We, they say when you fast, fasting quickens your prayer. Amen. Amen. It energizes your prayer. Amen. You begin to pray. Brother Brown says when you eat, your blood is in the stomach. Uh, that's why sometimes preachers, we don't, come, we don't eat when we come here because the moment you eat, eat heavy breakfast, the moment you come here, it starts turning around. You want to go to the uh, washroom. You want to, it starts boiling here. So when you fast and you don't eat, your blood goes to the mind. And you become sensitive to the inspiration of the Almighty. You become very sensitive to the Spirit. Because your body is under subjection. This is not wanting to go to eat a Nando's and eat a KFC. This one is, doesn't want a coffee and a tea. This one wants a coffee and a tea and a drink. You put it under subjection. Amen. But Brabham said the longest I've done is three days. I've done three continuous days. <clears throat> He says, Moses, you know what he did when he was uh, verse 27 of Deuteronomy 9, when he was uh, standing in the gate for the children of Israel. He fasted 40 days, and you know what he said to God? He says, verse 27, he says, remember thy servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So when you begin to intercede for somebody, you must remind God about the things he's done in the past. He says, remember thy servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Look unto Look not unto the stubbornness of these people, nor to their wickedness, nor to their sin. It may be your son, it may be your daughter misbehaving, going after the things. Well, you pray like that as well. Lord, don't look at her stubbornness. Don't look at the stubbornness of my son. Don't look at the stubbornness of my daughter. I am standing here as a mother in Israel, as a believer, claiming my own son. I want her saved, uh, him saved. I want my daughter saved. I want my mother saved. I want my brother saved. I'm standing in the gap. I'm fasting for her. I'm fasting for them. I'm afflicting my soul for their cause. Lord, you did to, uh, to, uh, to Moses. You pardoned a whole generation, a whole two and a half million, when one man stood in the gap for everybody. You heard the prayer of one man, and a whole people were saved from instant death. It says, let the land whence thou broughtest us out say, because the Lord was not able to bring them into the land which thou promised them, and because he hated them, he brought them out to slay them in the wilderness. Yet they are thy people and thine inheritance, which thou broughtest out by the mighty power and thy stretch hand. Um, amen. I'll just take a few examples. Um, in Job chapter 1, uh, the Bible says, uh, I'm taking Job being the oldest book, I'm taking an example of a man who stood in the gate for his children. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job and the man was perfect. He was upright. One that feared God and eschewed evil. He didn't want to, whenever he saw evil, he would turn around, he give his back. When people are beginning to talk wrong things, he would, he would close his ears. He is true evil. 
and there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she asses and very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. And his sons were, were, went and feasted in their houses, everyone his days, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and drink with them. Verse 20, and the Lord said, I'm oh, sorry, I think I jumped. Okay, uh, you know the story of Job. And then he would sacrifice. Job would sacrifice uh, for his children. Let, let, let me read verse 5. And, it, and so when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. In other words, Job was continually standing in the gap for his household, for his family, for his children, his sons and daughters. And I want to say as believers also, we fathers, we parents, we must stand in the gap for our children. We don't give up on our children no matter how bad they do, how much evil, how much disrespect they brought to the family, how much disgrace they brought to the family. We continue to stand in the gap for them day and night. They are our children. Thus, the Bible says, Job did continually. Abraham, our father of faith, he did the same. He was standing in the gap. One time, Lot was uh, uh, taken by the, we know the story, I read Genesis 18, and the Lord said, because the crowd of Sodom, Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is grievous, I'll go down and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood by the, before the Lord, and Abraham drew near and said, Will thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Abraham knew there was Lord there, his brother's, his brother's son. And he was now the mayor of the city, he had daughters and grandchildren. So he started interceding. Shall the judge of the whole earth? destroy Sodom if they are 50? God says, I will not destroy for the sake of the 50. He says, for 40, he now began to rejoice. You know the story? And he came. What was he doing? He was standing in the gap for his loved ones, for lords. He was arguing with God in prayer. He was arguing with God. He was uh, not arguing. He was interceding. The Bible says interceding. Until God said, if I find 10, I will not. Amen. Hallelujah. I take Rahab, the, the example as well. We all know the story. I'm just giving an example to build what I want to say now. Now, therefore, in Joshua chapter 2, verse 12, now, therefore, I pray you, I pray you swear unto me, by the, this is Rahab talking to the spies which Joshua sent, since I have shown you kindness, that you also show kindness unto my father's house. Brother Brown says, if you have got faith to be saved, you can have faith for your household. Amen. If you, sister, if you, brother, have got faith for yourself to be saved, you can have faith for your whole household. Amen. I had a quotation. I was listening to the churches the other day. Brother Ron says, oh, brother, who was that? Uh, we baptized the ninth one. Are they all in? There was a brother in the tabernacle who was interceding for his family. And while they were praying, Brother Branham under the Spirit says, I give you your family. Amen. I give you your family in the name of the Lord. And Brother Branham was say, was that the ninth one we baptized? Are they all in now? You remember when in the prayer meeting you were praying for your family and I gave you a word, thus said the Lord, I give you your family. Because somebody was interceding. Somebody was convinced and concerned. Someone was uh, concerned, loved his family so much. And he took time to fast and pray. And God answered. Look what Rahab said. And that you will save our life, my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have and deliver us lives from death. You know what? She made a request. She said, you will save my father. She started with immediate. My father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters and all that they have. Their children and grandchildren, everyone. That's what she said. And all that they have and save their lives. And I say, brother, sister, if Rahab could do that, a hallowed, why not us? We have received the message of the hour. We have got the truth. Let us intercede. Let us stand in the gap for our loved ones, our relatives. We start, he says, if you don't do anything for your immediate relative, you are worse off than an infidel. Amen. 
I like Brother Lano with his family. We had the testimony, his families. I saw when they were burying the poor bearers, uh, his sons taking their father to the grave with a heart knowing that their father is in, in glory land. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, I salute Brother Lino. Lino. Hallelujah. We need such brothers and sisters who stand until they are 84, until they are 90, still holding on to the word of God. Amen. Amen. I still believe in the things they believed 50 years ago, Amen. 60 years ago. Staying with their wives, 62 years. Was it six, nearly 62 years anniversary? Yeah. Nearly 62 years. Yeah. Amen. That's a good example. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. So Rahab got a request. God is faithful when you mean it. When you, he says, Psalm 37, if we delight in his statues, he'll give us the desires of your heart. Yeah. Commit all your ways to the Lord and trust in him and he'll bring it to pass. Yeah. So if you love, Brother Brown says, when love is projected and comes to its destination, sovereign grace takes over. Amen. Uh, verse 18. Behold, when we come, uh, no, I think I'll just jump now. In Acts chapter 12, there was a problem with uh, Peter was arrested uh, when they killed James, uh, brother of John, and then he was arrested. Peter was in jail. You know what the brother said? They said, how can we eat at home? How can we prepare supper as normal and eat? They fasted and prayed at John Mark. The brothers gathered at John Mark's house. And they started interceding, standing in the gate for Peter. That's why they stood in the gate for Peter. And when they, they put him in prison, they prayed. Verse 7, and behold, the angel of the Lord came at night, upon, uh, came at night, and the light shined in the prison, and the smote Peter and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. Amen. God had to send an angel. God still sends angels, brothers. There are still angels. Uh, angels are ministering spirits. Amen. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, they are ministering spirits uh, sent to those who are the heirs of salvation. How many are heirs of salvation this morning? Amen. Oh, I've got something from the word of God. Amen. God has got an angel assigned to you. Amen. To keep you because you are an heir of salvation. He gives his angel charge over you. Let your feet dash on the rock. Amen. The angels of God and come around those who fear his name. So be not afraid when you are a Christian. Be not afraid. Amen. You are not alone. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. When you are a Christian on your post of duty, nothing will harm you until God's purpose is fulfilled. That's what the prophet says. Amen. Amen. I want to say about Daniel again. Daniel in chapter 9, he was uh, in a distress, being arrested and so forth. And prayer and fasting. You know, Daniel was uh, praying and fasting, interceding for his people. Daniel chapter 9. I won't read now because uh, of my time. I wish I'd just highlighted like your pastor does, just the big uh, point in the whole quotation. Amen. We save time. But Daniel was in such a situation. And he started fasting and praying. He says, I set my face upon the Lord to seek my, by prayer and supplications, with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Sometimes you have to show God that you mean business. You don't wear a good suit like I'm wearing when you're fasting. You wear something rough. They put on sackcloth. And in the days where they fall on their faces and pray the whole day. You are meaning business with God. Then God says, I've heard your prayer. Daniel, for 21 days, he says, I ate no drink or bread. I was praying, concerned about his people. And the time, was, and then God dispersed angels. When you are interceding and you mean business, you begin to fast. I want to emphasize this fasting and pray. Prayer now, sometimes Jesus Christ came, the disciples were saying, in Jesus' name, there was an epilepsy demon. In Jesus' name, get away. In Jesus' name, the demon said, I can't get away. You have to mean more business. All of them tried, oh, get away, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Ah, they couldn't. Until the Lord came and says, oh, we can't cast this one. He says, yeah, some of these demons are stubborn. Some of them are hereditary. Some of them follow your tribe. Some of them follow your ancestors. It's in your bloodstream. It's in your, in your people. They don't just come by praying or just laying hands. You have to fast and pray and mean business. Then God enters to send some angels sometimes and away as ministering spirits. They will come now and chase away the devil. Psalm 35, the angels come and chase away the devil. Say, Hamba Satan! Hamba Satan! 
The angels of God can come and chase away the devil and persecute the enemy for you. Because the angels, they, they excel in strength. Amen. Amen. They excel in strength. So because we fight not against flesh and blood, yes. but we fight against principalities and powers Amen. and spiritual wickedness in high places. Amen. So we need sometimes the... Peter was full of the Holy Ghost, but he was chained. He couldn't do... Full of the Holy Ghost, but God had to send an angel. Amen. 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 Paul was full of the Holy Ghost. They were in the sea, ex church of 29, and they hadn't seen the the sun for over two weeks and the waves. I was uh, touring a beautiful town here on the bus. The pastor helped us put, uh, put on a hop off, hop off, and hop on. Hop on and hop off. We're seeing the beautiful and they were telling us some places they have got waves which come ten, ten, like a 10-story building. Yeah, sometimes. And I think Paul must have been one of these and they had almost given up. Paul had to now pray. I said, uh, can I die here? I must go to Rome. I must witness in Rome. Paul took upon himself and stood in the gate for the whole crowd that was in the ship. And he prayed until the angel of the Lord came in the ship. He says, Paul, I have heard according to your prayer. You are going to lose the ship, but I have given you all the souls of the people here. Because you have taken time to stand in the gate for them. I'll read a quotation. Um, quotation from applying the token, from the token message, uh, 630901, 362. Believe for safety. He says, then apply. See, here is what you want to believe in. See, you want your own safety. You believe for your safety. And then apply the token for the whole family. I want to say, friends, it's our time to stand for the whole family. If you are the only message believer in your family, when I come next time, I want to hear testimony that the whole family is in. Yeah. Hallelujah. If you can't pray alone, come and join. The deacon brother was telling me, the brothers come and uh, pray here. Uh, was it on two Wednesday? They come pray. Come and join the brothers for the prayer meeting. Yeah. Forsake some food. Come here yeah. and let's hear testimony. He says, talking for the whole family. See, you see, how can I do that? Claim it. Brother says, how can you do it? He says, claim it. Claim it. Claim it. Worked on you. Then you, if it worked on you, it, it, then, you, it, then the word comes. Amen. See, it works for both of you. You and the word are one. And then apply it to your children. Apply it to your loved ones. Like Rahab did. Brother says, applying the token. says, like Rahab did. She applied the token to her father. We can apply the token to our fathers. She applied the token to her mother. I applied the token to my mother as well. She is in glory tonight, but she died a saint. Amen. She applied to her brothers and sisters and got them all in. She got them all in. And I want to say, friends, get them all in. If you believe this one, tell somebody next year, I'm going to get all my family in. You can tell somebody, if you believe it, if you don't believe it, I'm going to get all men in. My children, my parents, I'm going to... Brother say, oh, all of them in. Even the drunkards, even the evil ones. I'm getting them all in. All in. All in. All of them in. I mean all of them. Oh, 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 A-double-L. All of them in. You apply it, Lord. I'm going after my son. I'm going after my daughter. I claim her. Satan, you got her loose. I'm coming after her. I apply my token, the Holy Spirit. Oh, Lord. Oh, Holy Spirit, that lives within me. Catch up my daughter there. You say, Holy Spirit, that lives in me. Catch up my daughter there. At work, wherever she's living with somebody. Catch my daughter from there. Catch her from there where she's living and living out. Catch her from there. I'm going to her now with your anointing upon me. He will do it. Amen. Don't go casual, go with the prayer. When you go to face somebody, go to testify, go pray it up. Yes. They will catch the anointing. They may not hear your words, but they catch the anointing. Yes. The scripture says it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. Yes. The anointing upon you breaks the yoke. Yes. The moment you really get there after you are prayed up and the anointing is on you, it will break the yoke. Yes. Uh, let's go on to the next uh, quotation. Uh, the next one, further down. Yeah. 
uh, paragraph 3, so it says, you know what Joshua said before crossing over? He said, wash your clothes, come not at your wives. So it is also cleansing. You need to cleanse yourselves. He says, wash your clothes. God wants you to wash yourself. Before you start interceding, you wash yourself. And so forth. And get ready. Within three days, we'll cross over. He was getting ready. He was applying the token. Amen. Get ready. Apply it. Believe it. Clean up. Let your children, let your family, let your loved ones see it in you. That's right. It will take effect. Let them also see you living a Christian life. Amen. Hey, the brother who is looking after me, there he is a Christian. God bless him. Amen. Amen. And I'm sure it's all coming from you here, all of you here. The stand we are doing uh, in my country, you've supplied many tents for outreach, and you are supporting ministers in our country, in the remote area, some of them, and in Malawi. Continue on. Amen. God bless it. That shows something has happened to you. You cannot part with your income and living humble as you do, and yet you are supporting and helping other people. God bless you. Amen. Let's go on the next one. Paragraph this says, then apply the token in prayer with the consideration and be, with believing. Apply with, with, the, with such love and so forth till you know it's going, to take, it's going to take place. When you testify and you want to win them, you don't say, ah, if you don't believe me, you're a serpent seed. Don't be rough to them. Don't be rough. Apply with love. They may have a little weakness. They may have a little weakness. Accommodate them for some time. While you're praying for them, slowly they'll come in. When they see the love, love is contagious. When they see love in you, they'll end up saying, my son is a Christian. My boy is a Christian. My daughter is a Christian. My dad is a Christian. My mom is a Christian. Apply with love. Be gentle with them. Apply it in confidence. Believing is going to help. When you talk to that child, when you talk to your husband, talk to your wife, talk to the loved ones, believe that it's going to help. Just stand there. Say, Lord, I have claimed them. They are mine. Amen. Hallelujah. I can start giving you a testimony now. Amen. Oh, yes. Loving that. Maybe I, I better give a testimony, but I wanted to read one more quotation. Amen. Amen. Because I wanted to give a testimony. You say, Brother John came, but he never told us what, what he's doing, where he is. Uh, but uh, I would like to read. Uh, well, there was Esther also. I've got a few examples. Uh, uh, but I wanted to read. Uh, a brother says, the reason... Uh, he says, sometimes you are losing love for your people. He says, sometimes the reason we don't testify, we don't stand in the gap for our people, we are losing love for our people. You have lost love, you have given up on them. You have lost love, and it's a pity. You lose love, uh, uh, love for your own father, your own mother, your own brother, your own sister. He says, the reason you are not doing anything for them is you have lost love. Brahman says, I was losing love for the people. And uh, it's a sad thing, I, I'm not reading the quote, but Brother Bram says, in standing the gap, I was losing love. He says, he says, Moses lost feeling for the people because they couldn't listen to him. He says, and if I don't have feeling for the people, I should have, I, until I get to the feeling, there is no need me going because it will, I will be a hypocrite. You must love people. You must love. He says, in paragraph 17, you pray that God will place into my heart that something that I lost out there in that complex. It's so easy to build a complex. Don't lose the feeling of the people. Don't lose the feeling of the people. See, you must remember they are not made of uh, sawdust. They are flesh and blood, human beings and so. Pray for them, all of you, and you will. God will bless you. Amen. God bless you now. Amen. Um, I, uh, then I'll give just because of my time. I want to give uh, uh, the last quotation. I will summarize it. Brother Brown talks about Auntie Jemima. We've all uh, read about it from the prophet. There was a woman, a colored woman in Memphis, Tennessee, in America. And she had a, she had a son. Honestly, she prayed for the son. She probably was barren, but she was uh, praying for a son. And the Lord gave her a son. And the son misbehaved when he grew up. He departed from the teaching of the mother. And he started uh, going out in the wrong company until he caught syphilis and he was dying. The doctors had given him just a few days. He was discharged from the hospital. Go and give him a peaceful rest so that he can die at home. You know what that saint did, that woman? Brother Branham, she said she, he said she fasted for three days. No food, no cooking, no activity in the kitchen. She says, I mean business. What would it benefit to eat with a dying son? The doctors are given. The, the medicine man has said there is no hope. 
The sickness has gone into the bones. You see, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, unhealable. She says, I've got one more consultation. I've heard what the doctor said, but this one now is not a physical, it's not a medical issue. It's a spiritual warfare. She says, I'm not even going to the church. I've asked the brothers to pray for me. I've asked the deacon, the trustees. I've asked them to anoint my door son with all they've done. But now it's between me, the mother, and my Lord. In the, she made her house an altar. She started praying all night. Until the prayer of that woman, brother, says, it stopped the jet plane. Flying over Memphis, it landed. She found a place in the scripture of a Shunammite woman who prayed and Elijah the prophet was sent to her. She says, where is my Elijah? She says, where is my Elijah? And she prayed, send, send me my Elijah. She prayed, she prayed, she would rest, she prayed, she prayed while on her knees on the altar, she slept. And the Lord brought a dream. She was not a prophet to see a vision, but prophet says a dream which comes true is a vision. In other words, she's, the Lord brought a vivid dream. He says, I am sending you, your Elijah. Go and stand on the balcony outside. Ah, he's coming. He's wearing, a, he's wearing a gray suit and a hat and a bag. Your Elijah will come here. And from early morning, she was standing at the balcony of, of, the balcony of her house until the Jew fell on her. She had a man she had tied on her head and she had the Jew on her palms. And then she saw Brother Branham coming. The prophet had to walk about for almost four or five miles from the hotel to her doorstep because a woman was standing in the gap. When did you last fast for your son? When did you last fast for your brother, your sister, your husband who is not believing, your wife who is not believing, or your relative? When did you last fast? And she fasted and she prayed until the prophet came right at her doorstep and said, good morning, pastor. Amen. And he says, how did you know, auntie, that I'm a pastor? He says, please come in. I knew you were, I knew you were coming. I knew you were coming. I knew you were coming. Why? Because you were standing in the gap for her son. And the prophet came in and says, I've been in King's Palace. I've been in Buckingham Palace where I prayed for King George when he multiple salosis. Says I was in Sweden there where the palace of the rulers. Says I've been in South Africa at the Kruger's Rand where the president and the officers, the leaders of this country go for their holiday in Kruger National Park in their fabulous holiday places. Says I was there. Says but I never felt more at home in that woman's house. She lived in the ghettos. In the shanties where the colored people stayed. She says in their home, there was a God bless work, God bless our home. She says, I felt more welcome than when I was at Kruger National Park. In the rulers of South Africa's palaces, I felt more at home. In that shanty town house. Says, uh, she told me, so I said, do you know my, my brother Branham, I'm a minister who pray for the sick? Says, I don't know. He says, oh, I want this, my son. He says, he's, he's dying, but I don't want, I don't even care about his healing. I want him saved. Amen. If he's healed, he can go sin again with his bad friends Amen. and go back to the same thing and get the same disease again. But I want him saved. Amen. If my son can say I'm saved, then I'm happy. Amen. Brother Brown said to the woman, uh, Auntie, can you lead us in prayer? He says, oh, my. That woman knew how to stand in the gate. She knew how to talk to God. She had talked to God before. She said she could pray a prayer that will shake the, an archangel. She said she would pray a prayer which will make your back of your hair stand. Brother Abraham says, I can still hear her prayer. Even now, many years after, she said, I can still hear her prayer. She says, by the time she finished praying, she says, God, I know you're on the job. Lord, I know you're on the job. Says by the time she finished praying, she says, I was crying. I was crying. Brother, she made the prophet cry. By her prayer, because she was used to interceding. She was used to interceding. She was used to prayer. And brother said, I just prayed for that boy. I said, Lord, my plan now, I'm worried. I'm two hours late because they had to walk five miles 
to come to that house. The plane was supposed to leave off, and he was late. He says, now I don't know my plane is gone now. What shall happen? Uh, if you have sent me for this woman, Lord, may you heal her. And just laid hands on her. Before Brother Bram finished praying, there was already, there was already, the boy was waking up and says, Mama, Mama, it's becoming light here. There's light here. There's light coming in the room. There's light coming in the room. Because prayer was being mad. Because prayer was being mad. Somebody was standing in the gap. Somebody was standing in the gap. Somebody was standing in the gap. By the time the prayer was finished, the boy was seated talking to his mother. Mother, I don't know where I was. I don't know where was I. Where was I? But I'm back now. Brother Branham sneaked out and went and got a cab, got to the, to the, to the airport. And the airplane, instead of taking off two hours, it was again delayed, waiting for Brother Branham to come back. Because the power of prayer, somebody was interceding. And by the time Brother Branham was this last call for the flight, and Brother Branham walked in, he says, the prayer of that woman interceding for her son. Stop the jet plane. Amen. Delay this takeoff again Amen. for the prophet to come back. Amen. I said, the same God is alive. Amen. The same God is alive this morning. Amen. That God is here this morning. He can do the same to your loved ones. He can do the same to anyone's problem here. He can do the same to each and every one of you. Two years later, Brother Brown says, I came to Memphis, uh, that side, I was getting on the train, and a huge boy stopped me. He says, pass on, pass on, pass on, brother, pass on. He says, oh, you don't remember me. I'm that boy. He says, which boy? He says, that one which you, which you prayed for and I got healed. He says, I'm not only healed, I'm a Christian now. <laughs> Two years later, a mother stood in the gap. I'll just give a big, brief testament of myself also. I come from Zimbabwe, from a Church of England background. Uh, I went to high school, boys' high school. I was confirmed. My, mother, my grandfather was a Church of England. My mother was also a Church of England. And father, they were married in the Church of England in Mutare. And uh, I was sent to a boarding school, Church of England, in St. Mary Magdalene Secondary School in Yanga. I rushed because now I'm just giving a testimony. Um, at the school, the, high, the school priest would ask for volunteers to help him and save us in the church. I volunteered as well, but I was not converted. Something had not uh, touched my heart. I was just following my grandfather and my mother at Church of England. So I finished school, went to Arari, started working for Barclays Bank uh, for three years. Then I did a lot of wrong things that time because I was not serving the Lord. I even lost my Anglican uh, belief. I was just like the world going with bad company. Uh, then something happened. I met my wife at that time in Harare. She was also working for the bank. But something, in that, even that dark age, I could hear something told me, uh, that is your wife. And we, I went and we got married and we were happy. We moved to Highlands where we were renting a house. I still had a bit of uh, trouble uh, with it. <laughs> Ancestral disease of drinking a little bit. <laughs> so coming from... So coming from work, I would go through the pub. I went to a pub in Highlands to drink. I drank three pints of beer. On my way back home, trying to go, I tried to take a shortcut, and something supernatural happened. Amen. I heard a voice. I cannot tell what it was, but something told me, stop. You are going into an ambush. There are thieves ahead of you. Go back to the pub and go around the, with the, with the road with the streetlights. I was taking a short path. And I was not disobedient. If I disobeyed that voice, I will not be here today. But I ran back about three months. The same voice said, stop, look where you're going. And from where I was standing now, about where the deacons are at the back, uh, I saw men, four men come from one side of the little path and another three from there. They came to the, to the path. Looking at me, they wanted to see whether I was very drunk, whether they could run after me. But then so the voice said, run. I ran home fast and went to my, I flew like a lightning, running, the beer left me. The beer left me. Straight, I went to my wife. I said, honey, I was going to be a dead man. But something happened. I don't know whether it's the ancestral spirits or whether it's Muzimu or what spoke to me. I, but something saved me. So from that day, I stopped going to drink. I was behaving a bit of a good boy, so I was doing... We used to have jobs. My wife we did to wash, wash the dishes and the clothing and the cooking. I did the outside. I washed the car and did the grounds. 
uh, of the house, uh, the woman, and so forth. So my wife was cooking. One day I was making vegetables for carrots and cabbages for our house, digging. I worked a bit late, and something spoke to me. It says, go to the church where your two young brothers are going, and let the pastor come to preach to you. Preach to you and your wife. I went inside the house. I said, why? Because I waited a bit late. It was the moon was shining bright and there were stars. I had worked late. And something said, go and uh, call the pastor where your two young brothers are going. My young brothers had become Christians. But I was not. I was, it was during the war. There was fighting in Zimbabwe. My mother said, John, can you look after your young brothers? Farai's uh, father. And my, his twin brother, who is late now, says, look after them in Harare because they'll go join the war and uh, we don't like them to be child soldiers. So I was looking at them, but they'd been converted, and I saw a big time they'd received the message of the hour at that time. And they were going to the message of their brother Maxwell because I was preaching, and our sister was there in Southern Dawn. <laughs> Amen. So I said, what? And the voice also said, leave, get out of this place. Leave this place where I stay, go and stay in another suburb in Highfield. I was staying in Highlands at that time. It was soon after independence. It was 1980, and it was still very... Very leafy suburb. It was the best suburb in uh, Harare at that time. That's where all the government people stayed in Harare in Highlands. So it says, leave the go in there. I live in Mastons, uh, old Highfields. Go there. So I went to my landlord. I said, I've heard uh, something is telling me. Uh, do you have any house anywhere else? I want to live where I'm staying. He said to me, oh, I've just finished building a beautiful house in Stones, Highfields. I've got the keys here. You can take the keys, go and move in and bring the keys of the old house when you have finished moving. I said, God works in, in mysterious ways. I moved there and went to our first baby. And then uh, I went to see the pastor. He, he, I said, can you come in my house? I went to their church. I, I, I didn't hear anything. They were preaching. I didn't hear. <laughs> they were preaching on the seals and the seven thunders and so forth. So I, I was new. I didn't hear anything. <laughs> I said to the pastor, can you come to my house to preach to me? He says, no, you come to church. This is a church. You come and hear from here. I said, no, uh, something told me you must do it personal to me and my wife. So the pastor agreed. He came and preached in our, in our house. And uh, we had a few friends, the old timers at that time. Uh, it was in 1980, somewhere there. And we, he preached to me, to us. And uh, at the end, he asked for an altar call. We invited many people in the house. And at that altar call, me and my wife were the only two who came to the altar. And we gave our hearts to the Lord in our own house. Then he organized baptism. He said, does anybody want to get baptized the next Sunday? I said, yes, I want. I didn't see my wife lifting up her hand. So I said, I want. He says, next Saturday we're going to baptize. They didn't baptize in the church at that time. We went to Mkuis River near Glenora B. Flats where the pastor says, so we went on a Saturday carrying my change of clothes. I didn't see my wife putting her change of clothes in her bag, but she did. When we got there, they asked, who wants to be baptized? I stood up, and I saw my wife also standing here. So the baptism was for us two. Uh, those days, the pastor says, uh, brother, we don't want to baptize the wet sinners, and they come out to wet, uh, wet sinners. We want you to repent. Confess all your sins you've done from childhood to now. So I had to do an open air confession with the whole congregation hearing. I said everything. Say it, say, they used to say, say everything. <laughs> Repent, brother, say everything. <laughs> say everything. So that's what they used to do. They said, we want to break the bridges. Because when we put you in the water here, we, want you, we don't want you to go drinking, smoking, and doing those funny things. We want everything broken. So I confessed a full confession. My wife, the same. I went into the water. Brother says, brother... Did you confess everything? Because the Bible says, repent and confess your sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of those sins which you have confessed. Repent of your sins. So I went into the water. He said, if you remember, is there anything you were a bit shy to say before the public? You can now say it. We are two here in the water. So I looked again. I said, everything. I said, brother, I have combed my life now. I think so. everything says, uh, brothers, upon the confession of Brother John, that he believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, this afternoon we are going to baptize him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I went into the water and out. Brother, I don't know what to say, but something happened. 
Immediately, I felt like a big load I was carrying was taken off of me. I literally looked like it, oh, everything I confessed was being washed by the Mukwis River going down the river. I came out of the water feeling so light. We went to the pastor's house. I saw the birds singing. They were singing differently. <laughs> Everything was so sweet, so nice, so good. I, I couldn't explain it. And then we went to the, he gave me a Coca-Cola. Just a Coca-Cola. It tasted different. <laughs> so good. So sweet. Everything was so sweet. I don't know. Something supernatural happened. Then the brother said, do you have a cassette uh, player? I said, yes, I've got a Supersonics 177 stereo. <laughs> Big one. Says, uh, go and play this tape. He gave me this tape. I never forget it. It was from Brother Retief. The Retief said, the one he was duplicating. It was, it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Oh, yeah. Tape number 61111 something, 101. Uh, Preached in 1961. So after baptism, I went to my house. After we ate, I went to the bedroom. I put that in. Let me listen to that tape the prophet, uh, the pastor gave me. I put it in. Oh, brother. Oh, brother, sister. I have never heard a man preach like that. Amen. From reading of the text, I heard my name be pre being mentioned. I'm John. Because when my father and mother got married in the Church of England, they said, if the Lord gives us a... My father said to my mother, if the Lord blesses us with children and gives us a man child, we are going to call him John the Baptist. Amen. And I came being called John the Baptist, and I heard the prophet read from Matthew chapter 3, verse 15 to 18. Jesus coming to be baptized by John the Baptist and tell him, I am not worthy, and Jesus says, suffer it to be so now, John, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. I heard that. I heard my name being mentioned. And Brother Brown preached and preached. It is about one and a half hours tape. When he came to the end of preaching, he says, I have finished preaching. If what I have preached is the truth, God is uh, uh, duty bound to come and vindicate it. I never heard a man preach like that. And when that happened, I don't know, he says, play the organ, only believe all things are possible. He says, you know what I'm waiting for? I'm waiting for the angel of the Lord to come. And then he said, he is here now. When he said that, something came down in the room where I was. Glory divine filled my soul. I felt like a garment of righteousness coming upon me, going down my body, going to my heart. And for the first time, I screamed, hallelujah. Amen. I started praying. I got lost in prayer. For the first time, it was no longer me praying, but something inside my heart. Amen. My heart was almost like pumping out words and praying like I never did before. And brother, sister, I don't know how long that prayer lasted, but I, was, I had a good time in the Lord. And the Lord filled me with the Holy Ghost on the very first step I listened to. I became a new creature. I go, became a changed man. From that very minute, I was no longer the old John who used to smoke, who used to drink, who used to do wrong things. Something happened. There was a change. There was a new birth. A genuine conversion from the soul. I mean, something happened to me that day. I began to love the Bible. I started, I, I, nobody, no deacon followed me to my house to see whether I've taken all the records of uh, Elvis Presley and all those uh, deep people, all that, uh, Jimi Hendrix, that I used to enjoy. The next morning, I took them out to the bin. I did a house cleaning on my own, house cleaning. I am now a Christian. I was baptized yesterday, and something happened last night when I listened to the tape. I did a house cleaning in my house. All the clothes, the shorts I used to wear, threw them. I used to do karate kung fu fighting near a black belt, threw all the belts to the bin. Said, I'm starting a new walk with the Lord. Yeah. I, started, I started going to work with my Bible. When I got in the bus, I opened the scripture, I started reading from where I left in the morning. Somebody asked me nearby, what book are you reading? I start testifying there. I ask for their address and whether I can come and visit them to talk the word of God. And we will follow them up. Some after work, we are going to see somebody. You talk to on the bus. Then three months later, that, was, that happened on the 8th of August when I was baptized and received the Holy Ghost. 8th of August, 1981. 8th of August, 1981. I never forget that day. It was a great day in my life. 
Then I went to, uh, four months later, I went to at Christmas, my wife had a baby, so there was a, we didn't have a car at that time, and we, 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 I, couldn't, I couldn't go with my wife and baby because of the traffic. Uh, buses would be crowded. So I wanted to bring my mother some food, some meat. She, she likes pork, she likes a lot of pork chops, pork chops or something like that. I, I bought uh, the meat she wanted and some bread uh, for Christmas. So I said to my wife, I'll come back uh, on Boxing Day. I'll go there and just give my mother Christmas, then I'll come and join you on Boxing Day. I think there won't be many people traveling. I'll travel on Boxing Day, but not on Christmas Day. I'll be with my mother and come back and join you. So we did that. When I went to my house now for the first time after I was converted, I saw my mother was uh, in sin. She was uh, brewing kachatsu and selling, you know, the illicit brew. And she was Church of England, she would wear uniform and go to their meetings every Thursday and Sunday. But she was drinking and I said, Mama, you are going to hell. You are not a Christian. You, you says, John, I'm a Christian. I was a Christian before you. I was uh, married in the Church of England. I was married with your father in the Church of England. And uh, what are you saying? I said, I'm going to hell. I said, yes, Mama, you're going to hell. So I tried to talk. I wasn't also very strong. I wasn't very with love. I was doing it very roughly. Uh, so I couldn't win the battle with her at that time. I went back home to Harare to see my wife. The moment I got home, I felt such a burden for my mother. I couldn't rest. I said, I want my mother to say, my, mother just, my father just died two years earlier on. Uh, so I said, my father died, but my mother, if she dies, I have received the light. If she dies, it's my responsibility. She sent me to school, she did everything she did to me, supported me in everything. It's my duty now to testify to her. I told my wife, I can't find any rest in Harare now. I want my mother saved. I said, how can I do it? So I prayed and the Lord revealed to me, says, you cannot get your mother saved if you're staying here. You can bring her here, she can hear the, enjoy the word here, but she won't get saved. You take the gospel to her, where she is. You go, maybe change your job, get from Harare, go to Mutari, a small town, and stay there. Then you can go take your mother from home, from the rural home, to church. You can go and preach to her there, or you can ask the preachers and you go, then she will receive. It was revealed to me. So I said to my wife, uh, I think we need to change cities now. Uh, I think we have to move to Mutari. I am no peace here. If I stay here, I'm going to die. You are going to lose your husband. So I went to the pastor, Brother Jeremiah. Mkangan was our pastor at that time. I said, Brother Jeremiah, I feel like going to Mutari. I want my mother saved bad. I have no rest. I have no peace here. He says, Brother John, there's no church there. The ministry is here. You, the brothers, you backslide there. There's no church. I said, Brother, if I stay here, where the brothers are, I will die. Because something has been put on my heart. My mother must get saved. Maybe I get my mother saved first, then I come back. Then the pastor says, oh, Brother John, it seems like something is on you. You have got a burden. Can I help you? I said, well, at that time now I had a car. It was now in 82. I said, I want to sell my car. I want to sell, pay all my debts. I don't want to go to Mutare with any debt. I want to pay my labola. Lobola, we pay labola dory for our wives in Zimbabwe, traditionally. So I said, I want to pay labola and finish it. And then I went to go to Mutare to testify to my mother. The pastor helped me. He bought my car, gave me money. I paid my lobola. And then I told my in-laws, I'm going to, with your daughter to Mutare now, uh, to my people. They were not very happy because Harare was a central place where everybody goes. But anyway, we quickly went to Mutare. Uh, and we met Pastor Chikose. He was also beginning to go there. He was from a deacon in Harare. Brother Joseph Chikose was a deacon. He was going to minister to a few friends there. A few believers were there, Brother Denma Tanga and a few others. Um, and then we went there, Brother Joseph, I phoned Brother Joseph, I was told he's the one ministering there, I phoned him, he said, oh, Brother John, I've just got a three-bedroom house I'm renting, you can come and share and stay with me in the same house. So we went there and uh, we had such a, the moment we got to Mutari, my wife and I said, oh my, we felt so much at peace. It was, I said to my wife, we're at the right place at the right time. This is where God wants us to be. To serve him. And I tell you, friends, we served in Mutare under Pastor Chikose for 22 years. The moment I got there, Brother Chikose made me his trustee and uh, treasurer. I became the right hand man of the pastor. For 22 years, we traveled half the world together. Uh, America, Canada, Europe, Britain, Poland, Switzerland, many, many places. The two of us will go hunting together. We'll go in the bush, in the Zambezi, hunt in the Chirundu area, hunt, big game together. 
The moment I got to Mutare, I said, Pastor Chikose, I come here for a reason. I want my mother saved. He says, oh, let's go together see your mother. So we went on a Saturday in the rural area, Chitepo DC, Mutasa, on the road to Nyanga. I said to my mother, I have just changed jobs. Now I have come, I looked for a cheaper, smaller, lower paying job in Mutare. Because in Arari, I had a long job with a lot of money. I mean, at the bank, we were some of the, the white people were living at that time. It was soon after independence. So we were getting the jobs now. A lot of people were coming to South Africa. We didn't want to wait for more to uh, the Rwanda Mugabe. So we were getting all the jobs. So we were getting the very cheap jobs. So I had left a cheap job now to come to a, a, a lower place. And we went to see my mother. My mother said, John, you have left that house in Arari. Where shall we go and stay now when we go to Arari? Why are you mad? I said, Mama, I have come for you. I want you saved. He said, you have left your job for me. She couldn't understand it, but I was applying the token. <laughs> that day, a miracle happened at our village. Brother, sister, I lie not. We invited the gathering. The people came together to see me. Firstly, I brought them, my wife and my daughter. They hadn't seen my daughter. So as a custom in the rural area, the people gather to see if they hear your son has come from Harare. We also bring bread and jam and butter. They like that. So we <laughs> brought jam and butter and tea. So the whole many people gathered at the village. And we said we are going to have a meeting. And Brother Joseph Chikose preached that evening. A message I'll never forget up to now. He preached, shall the son of man find faith when he comes again. Amen. And he preached in vernacular, in our Shona language, and the Holy Ghost came down. Amen. In honor of for my desire to get my mother saved, the Holy Ghost came down that night like never before. He ended the sermon by making an order call. Is there anybody here who wants to give his heart to the Lord tonight? Then he sang a song, I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I'll follow him all the way. He sang and made an old-fashioned Methodist call, altar call. And people flocked to the altar. I've got a picture there. One of my cousin and sisters who was looking after my mother gave her heart to the Lord. I want a picture to be shown on my PowerPoint there. That one on the middle with the brown. brown. She was a little girl, 16 years. She's now... In her fifth, she, those are now her daughters. In the she's married to a pastor in Mashingo. Uh, yeah, uh, she's called Gladys. She was there. She was uh, the one nursing my mother. The Holy Ghost fell upon her. She sang the whole night. She couldn't sleep that night. Throughout the night, praying, and the many others who were there, they were hit by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then we went. That night, the Lord did a miracle which, uh, you know, sometimes you just make a first step and God takes it over. Amen. You make the first step to save, to, uh, to apply the token to your loved ones and God takes it over. Amen. When we did that, the Lord took over from me now. He reigned the Holy Ghost that night. My mother knew now the difference between her church and the message of the hour. I didn't have to explain to her. Something supernatural happened. The Lord took it over. Like he did Shamgar's uh, Osgot. Like he did Samson's uh, Bo Joe Bone of a Mule. He took over. Yes, that night, many people gave themselves to the Lord. And we went back to Mutare. On Sunday, we were having church in Mutare. The people who gathered on Saturday came back to my mother's house. Where is your son and that preacher? We didn't come back. The following was Sunday. They gathered again. The following Sunday, they gathered again. The following Sunday, they gathered again. Until my uncle, a white child, said, followed me, John, what have you done? You preached. Me, people are gathering at your house from that day. So I spoke to Pastor Chikose, what shall we do? Pastor says, we'll send a deacon every two weeks or once a week. So we started. Then a church started in my mother's house. Today, there's a church with over 300 people. We built a church for them there. <laughs> Pastor Edward Masaiti. Some of you know Pastor Edward Masaiti. He's the evangelist. He's an evangelist. He's the pastor there. And the last time I was there last year, there were four ordained ministers sitting on the platform. And they've got many outreaches. So the Lord took over from my little burden and he spread the gospel in the area. Until the chief and his wife in the area, the headmen of the area, are believers. When the brother started preaching in the funerals, the old Methodist and old Church of England veterans say, oh, these boys were fun on Evangelia. They say, these boys have got the gospel. Yeah. And they are receiving it right now. Yeah. 
to close now, my time is up, it's two minutes after 12. Um, so my children grew up in Mutare. Everything we did prospered. We also started a small church until in 1987, we also built our own church like yours. Uh, we built it as a 250-seater. Uh, we were just about 25 brothers, really. I was the treasurer. The, the little things we'd pledge was nothing to, but we did the work of faith. When we dedicated the church, uh, Bruru George Martin came and uh, dedicated our church in 1987 in December. I think it was around the 15th or somewhere of December, and he dedicated the church, and the Lord did a miracle. Amen. When we finished building the church, dedicated like that, the church was full. Amen. From about uh, maybe 70, with our children, with our women, we were about 75 at that time. Brothers, maybe about 20, 25. The church was full to full capacity. We extended four meters like you did there. We also extended four, four, four meters there, the church field. We extended, we removed the toilets and built another block outside. The place is full. Until now, the church, the pastor says, because of transport also, a lot of the brothers had big families. He says, okay, we are going to open prayer groups in the Dangamvura, Digon, be in charge there. They are building another church there. Chikanga, those in Kangaroo, Chikanga, stay there. Digon will look after you. Those there in Sakuva, another church. Now from that one church in Mtare, there are over five. Last uh, convention in Mtare, from the little group we started, there are over 7,000. They couldn't fit in any building. They couldn't fit in any building. They had to hire a football match and pitch a tent, a market. They counted over 7,000 chairs and they were awful. Then my children was going, as I closed, uh, my children were going to UK for studies. Uh, the things, you know, the situation in Zimbabwe was going down. I was in business myself, I was the treasurer of the church. I did all to support the gospel. My cars were available to any minister. I would go take, I would take the shoulder of the pastor. Any visitors, I would take them around the whole country. I used my own petrol. I would pick them at the airport, bring them back to the airport. And I supported the pastor fully with all the resources. And the Lord blessed me with a business, and I was employing 40 brethren. At our company, I had three branches, Mutare, Rusape, and Harare. But as my children were growing, I felt uh, the education was poor. I said I could leave them money, but they would lose it. I wanted them a good education, so I sent them to UK. Five children, I said I want them all to have UK degrees or something. Then he, if my time is up, they will look after themselves. I have done myself as a job. So when they started going, my daughters went. I felt I will lose these children. If they go there alone, they will become rasters. They will become <laughs> lesbians. They will become gay people. Oh, sorry. sorry. I'm not speaking against those, but they will come. They will have funny ideas. So I said, my wife, go there. I said, my wife, go and look after the daughters. I will look after these. As soon as they get their metric there, all level, I'll bring them, we'll come and support them fully there. So I eventually went to UK. And when I got there, I was shocked. Uh, the churches were empty. Churches were being sold into pubs and mosques and uh, shops. I was living in Sheffield, and there was no church there. I said, what? What is this Ichabod written in this land? Uh, the nearest church was Birmingham and, uh, Manchester, and Manchester, one and a half hours away. I said, can I witness to people and go to Manchester? I think... We better do something. So I said to my wife, I think we're going to start a fellowship here. I had seen it happen in my mother's house. I had seen it happen in Mtar. I said, we're going to start prayer meeting in my house. We will call the English pastor. I had a student visa. I said, because we are foreigners, we will align ourselves to a pastor here who is a British white, so that you marry, you baptize, you sort out the problem. When we are told to go back to our country, we leave everybody under hands. So I went to talk to Pastor Noble. I said, I'm starting a fellowship in... Sheffield, me and my wife, we are going to put our tithe together, and my children will pay for the building, and we will support the ministers who will come. When you come here, we make sure, Pastor, you are paid your whatever is paid, whatever you need, but the tithe will be there. We are going to rent a building, and we are going to support. If you are not coming, we send another minister, we will support him from here. And then I just sent a text to a few brothers. I had a brother, Peresu Gerald, from, who was in Bulawa. He says, Brother, he came, the two of us. We came for the first meeting in Sheffield to start a fellowship. I didn't have inspiration to preach anything, so I put a tap led by the Spirit of God. When we listened to that tap led by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit came down. In our very first meeting, as if he was confirming that this was long overdue, to have a, a soul-saving center. Like this is a soul-saving center. We were opening a soul-saving center in Sheffield. And we did that. Soon after we finished, we say, how are we going to operate? I say, brother, we exchange. You, the song leader, I deaconize. 
when you when I, when you finish uh, song leading, you deaconize. I come and do the preaching. Our wives will play the tambourines. Our children will do something with the instruments. We did that. The Lord, when you do something just to make a step, He takes over. The right. first day we finished, a woman came, walked in, and nurse says, "I was uh, I heard you singing my vernacular songs. I'm working. I'm a nurse nearby. Please, I would like to become a member of your church." He says we are actually deciding whether we should start or not. He says, "No, no, no. For my sake." This, your church, which you are is going to be my church. She's still there 17 years later. She brought her three sons and daughter-in-law and three grandchildren. There are seven souls from that one sister who came the first day. The church began to grow. We had students from Malawi, from Zambia, from uh, Congo, a lot of Congolese. The Lord gave us a lot of Congolese families. We had seven families from Congo. Almost 40 people came one day. The fellowship grew. And uh, then we continued for over three years, and the church had already grown. So we, brother was in Leicester, brother Perez, I said, why don't we start another outreach, another prayer meeting? You are traveling twelve, one and a half hours every seven to come. Let's start a prayer meeting. So they looked for a place in Leicester, and the Lord went before us. You know, when God gives you an age to do something, you just do your part, and God takes it over. Amen. Brother Perez and Sister Perez invited five families for a prayer, first prayer meeting in Leicester, and those five families all believed. They started coming every Thursday. Then they said, why are we not meeting here on Sunday? We started we, we, uh, meeting there on Sunday, and the church outgrew us in Sheffield. Today, there are over 250, almost 300. Brother Crosby Maliko is now preaching there. On that is, uh, outreach we started. The very first baptism there, I have never witnessed a baptism like that in England or anywhere else. We baptized 11 people. And on that day, Brother Crosby just gave uh, the uh, Brother Alex Okeni preached uh, from uh, Nigeria. And Brother Alex Okeni, uh, um, Brother Crosby just gave a testimony. Uh, he said, please, we want the Holy Ghost. You old people, pray for the Holy Ghost. We want these people who are baptized to be filled with the Holy Ghost even before. Well, Peter had speculated, let the Holy Ghost fall upon them and let, let's baptize people who are filled. Amen. And I saw a miracle that day. Amen. People received the Holy Ghost, we prayed. Amen. And the Holy Ghost came down. And people received the Holy Ghost before they were baptized. Amen. We literally baptized drunk people. Amen. Brother Alex was baptizing as a big man. He was struggling with some of the sisters, pulling them out of the water. And they were staggering under the power of the Holy Ghost. And when they went into the change room, they were praying. They couldn't stop praying. They come and change their clothes, they embrace their relatives, and you see them crying. Something had happened. I remember one family who is a deacon, Brother Charles Mafeka in Leicester. He went home after the baptism in Leicester, in England. After their meal, they prayed, uh, they had a meal, then they started praying. When they started praying, they couldn't stop praying until the next morning. Something had happened. Another brother was staying with some relatives. After we baptized, he went home to his home. In his room, he just went, didn't even eat, went into his room, started praying. After midnight, the people were phoning the pastor there. What has happened to this boy? Today, he can't stop praying. He's still praying. It's almost one o'clock. He started praying the moment he came here. He's still praying. Something happened. The Lord went before us. And I want to say, brother, uh, let's stand in the gap. We are standing in the gap in England. Pray for us. We thought we were just going for our children, but we are missionaries. We've started another group in Leeds. It's also a big church now. I can tell the story, but uh, Brother Alan Charo was a digon. He started, he was going to Manchester. We started another group there, and it's a full church right now. Amen. Nearly 15 years, 100 people. Another group in, in Nottingham, and many other groups are starting right now in, Le in Manchester. Brother Tambo was here. Brother Dr. Blaise Tambo, I think he came here. He started a group in Berry. We went to preach for him not long ago. There are many groups. England has been quite dry. But the prophet says you're going to send missionaries from Africa. Pray for us. We are standing in the gap in Great Britain. We started another group in Edinburgh. Brother Pasmo Chikuni is now leading a group. In, we started last year, and it's growing. We, are, we want to go. I'm happy I was at the cap here. We want to go to the north part of England, to Inverness, Aberdeen. This summer we'll be having some. We may order some tents from your church. <laughs> To preach, <laughs> to preach, we'll pay 50%. <laughs> God bless you. So let's stand in the gap, friends. I want to give over to the pastor. My message is let's stand in the gap. Don't give up on your relatives. God is looking for a man or a woman to stand in the gap. 
If you are saved, you get faith for your household. The jailer, when uh, the, 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 the brothers were delivered, when the angel came of the Lord, the jailer was said, what shall I do to be saved? He said, if you believe in the Lord Jesus, you and your household. Amen. So we also, you brothers, sister, and your household can be saved. Let's stand in the gap. Are you willing this afternoon to stand in the gap? Who is going to stand in the gap in Cape Town? Who is willing to stand in the gap for the millions, thousands of people who are dying in Cape Town? Who is willing this afternoon to stand in the gap? Are you willing? You can show by the raising of your hand. I want to hand over to the pastor now. Hallelujah. 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 The same God is able. He is able. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's all stand there. Amen. Let's just worship the Lord and let's give him praise. Father, we want to say thank you for your love, your grace, and mercy. We thank you for the word of God that uh, came to our hearts again today. And Lord, that we can stand in the gap in this end time, uh, become end time intercessors in the hour of judgment. We thank you, Lord, for the many good thoughts that was expressed today. And Father, we thank you for the testimony of God of our brother, Lord, how that you called him and how that you use him. And pray, God, for the believers of God in Matari and uh, different places in different parts of the UK. And we pray, O oh God, that you will just uh, bless him. One man in the hands of God, you can do so many things. Lord, you can express so many things. You can, Lord, uh, just one man, oh God, who has a burden. One man, oh God, that can stand in the gap. And oh God, as that uh, man came for that tree and said, Lord, I, this tree is not producing any fruits. I need to chop it down. And oh God, the wine dresser said, give me one more time. Give me one more year. I will dig it, I will dug it, I will work around it. I stand in the gap of the Lord between the tree. Father, we see, God, how that all this earth, Lord, was in chaos. And the God, the, the judge came down. The Lord, there was a man of God in Revelation 10, 7. And they said, Lord, I stand in the gap for the bride. I'll become an end time intercessor. I stand between the living and the dead, Lord, to intercede. We pray, O oh God, that you will bless our dear brother. We pray, O oh God, for his desire and his vision and his zeal for his family and for the believers. And uh, God, we pray that the hand of God will be upon him and with him. And that, O oh God, that you will just lead him and guide him. Father, we just want to say thank you for your love and your grace and mercy and your kindness, Lord, has been expressed to us today. We want to say thank you. And Father, we pray today, Lord, that you will bless our dear brother. Pray your God for Brother Joseph Latola. Pray God as our brother, uh, Lord, heals up in the hospital. Pray, God, that you will put your hand of healing and blessing upon him. We pray, O oh God, for many is a God who has, Lord, uh, been ill, O oh God, I pray that you will restore and bring back. Thank you, Lord, for the simplicity, Lord, of the man of God and the servants of the Lord, and how that, O oh God, you just take one man with a zeal and use him for that hour. Bless your people, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. And an amazing grace will always be my song of praise, number 156. Amazing grace shall always be my song of praise. For it was grace for, for it. I was great that brought my liberty that brought 